Deuteronomy chapter 31. We are going to read verses 1 through 13, and we will read them responsively. So I will read the odd verses. We will read the even verses together. Deuteronomy chapter 31, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. Let's read two together. And he said unto them, I am an hundred and twenty years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God, he will, be, he will go over before thee. He will destroy these nations from before thee. Thou shalt possess them, and Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. Verse 4. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did unto Sihon and to Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandment which I have commanded you. Verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Verse 7. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them. Thou shalt cause them to inherit it. Verse 8. The Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. Verse 10. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the feast of the tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord God in the place which he shall, go, he shall choose, Thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Verse 12. Gather to people together, and thy stranger that is within thy gate, that they may hear, and that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law. Verse 13, and we will pray. And that their children, which have not known anything, may hear, and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as ye live in the land whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege that we have to be in your house. Please, Lord, be with our ears. Open our understanding. Be with our hearts that we might receive exactly that which you'd have us to receive this morning. Please, be with Pastor Myers. Give him freedom, liberty, and grace to preach your word to us, your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I need not more men's in. 
empty praise Thou mine inheritance Now and always Thou and Thou only First in my heart High King of Heaven My treasure Thou Thank you. You have your Bibles open to Deuteronomy chapter 31. By the way, Taryn's back with us from Bible College back east, and she, she uh, assured me she got straight A's this semester, so her this year, so that's good. Good to have her back for a few days. Make sure you say hi to her. And I also, I, I forgot to, to mention, if you're with us this morning and it's your first time, we're honored to have you as a guest and we usually have you fill out a card if you've not already done so and put it, in the, put it in the offering plate, but I forgot to tell you that. So if you've not done that, if you do us a favor, maybe after the service and get one, we want to send you a little bit more information about our church, let you get to know us a little bit because we know that to know us is to love us, okay? Maybe not. You know, we live in an information age. We, due to advancements in technology, we have the ability... Uh, to communicate with people faster than ever before. It used to be, I remember years ago, early days of the church, pastor took a trip uh, to Cambodia. And when he got on the plane to leave, it's like, we're not going to hear from him and even know what's going on until he gets on that plane to come home. It just, you couldn't. Now I get texts from our team in Cambodia and I get calls from the other side of the world regularly. Things have changed. And we can communicate with each other on a regular basis whether it's our phones, social media, Twitter accounts, Instagram, you name it. One thing people fear with all the technology in our information age is that we will lose our ability uh, to personally communicate. By the way, it kind of is happening. That, that's a concern people have, that, you know, we're so connected and we have so many Facebook friends. But how many real friends do we really have? How much real communication? It's funny, last Sunday our family went out to uh, El Torito for like their buffet. That's good stuff. And I was sitting there and my son-in-law is like, look at the table next to us. <clears throat> and the table next to us was a family. It looked like a, a mother, a father, a younger daughter. It looked like grandma was there and there was the son. He didn't have earplugs in. He had the old school over the, over the ears headphones on and he was on his he was on his pad or his phone the whole time. It's like his family could be there, and he had no clue they were there. And you, how many of you, you see that when you go out, right? People just don't communicate. They're, they, let's have a date, and the date, and their friends are all hanging out, and they're all like this. It's like, you could have saved the money, okay? I just kind of think if you're going out to be with each other, you kind of ought to just be with each other. That's not the message. We see it in our, in our uh, society. But we have to understand communication is important. Communication is important in marriage. Okay? You say, I don't believe that. Then you're not married. <laughs> if you're married, you get that right off of the yeah. bat. Communication is important really in every relationship. If we don't understand each other, we make mistakes. Pastor used to always tell us in staff meeting uh, to make sure we understood something, the 
35 mile an hour rule is what he called it. He had read a book and a man had a car and it wouldn't start. And so it was an old stick shift. So he realized he wanted his wife to get in the other car and get up against a bumper and kind of push his car. And then she'd let go when it got to a certain speed. And then he would pop the clutch and it would start. So he told her, he says, now I need you, you're going to push me, so I need you to get to 35 miles an hour. She's like, got it. So he said he got in the car, she got in her car, and she took off. <laughs> and he's thinking, where is this woman? And as he was sitting in the car, he looked behind her, and he saw her coming. <laughs> she was going 35 miles an hour when she hit him from behind. Communication is important, okay? That's why I don't buy a stick shift, all right? Just get AAA. But it's important. We need to communicate with one another. We've all had times where we're talking to somebody and, they, and they've checked out, okay? How many of you, and do, you know, it's, we've all done it. How many of you have ever been talking to your, your spouse and you know that they've checked out, right? Not that they're mad or anything. It's just that, you know, they're in other, I'll talk to my wife sometimes, and I know she's thinking about something. I'm like, you're in Almasville, aren't you? Okay, so I'll just wait till you get out of Almasville, and then we'll talk to each other. But we've all, I've done that. Someone's talking, and you're thinking about something else. It's, oh, excuse me. The point is, words are important. Communication's important. And it's vitally important in our relationship with God. The book of Deuteronomy, which we read from, focuses on two things. First, it's a brief history that Moses gives, and he goes back through the history of the children of Israel up to that point, how they came out of Egypt, all the things that God has done in their lives and, and the mistakes they've made, and he's preparing them or getting them ready to go into the promised land. That's what it's all about. So where we are picking up in Deuteronomy, Moses is at the end of his life. The fact of the matter is this is really some of the last instructions He's going to give the children of Israel before they go into the promised land. And he's brutally honest with them. He tells them that they're going to go away from God. And he understands that. So how does he understand that? Well, number one, God told him. And number two, he had dealt with the people for 40 years. He kind of knew their bent. He's trying to encourage them and stop them to do that. He has already set up the next leader who's going to be Joshua. More importantly, he's going to leave them with something that is of the utmost importance. It's the words of the law. Their version of the Bible at that time. And the, he's trying to tell them that it's very important that they are in the Bible. You see, the gods they worship in those days were nothing more than stones, myths, sun, moon. They did not speak to the people directly. There was no word of the sun there was no word of the moon. There was no word from Baal. It was just some religious exercise they would do. Usually immorality was involved with many of the forms of worship which they had. And once they left worshiping, there was nothing that changed their life on a regular basis. But God was different. God gave his people his word. God spoke to them as he speaks to us through the Bible. He left them his word for them to follow. Unlike the idols and the false religions of his day, he wanted them to be people of his word. The Lord has done the same for us. He has given us his word in the Bible. But, like the children of Israel, if we're not careful... We're not following the Word of God in the Bible. Like we talked about at the beginning where there's lack of communication in our society today. If we are not in the Word of God, then there's going to be a lack of communication between your God and yourself. That is how God communicates to us. God communicates to us very clearly through His Word. And so what is Moses doing here is he's ready to depart the scene. Joshua's in place. They're ready to go. He's leaving, and he wants them to be ready for what God has. 
Well, he wants them to understand the purpose of God's word and to accept God's communication. So he does this in two ways. First of all, I want you to notice he's going to give them some preparation. Some preparation. Moses is trying to prepare them before he tells them exactly what they are supposed to do for with, with God's word. Motivation is important. For without it, we really do nothing. Everything we do in one way or another is, is done by some type of motivation that we have in life. God has given us motivation for salvation. We can accept it. And as the song we sang, talked about, we'll see Jesus one day in heaven. Or we can reject it and suffer the punishments that would come in hell. So I don't like when, you know, you mention hell. I don't like to mention hell either. If I could cut one thing out of the Bible, I would never do that. But if I could, it would be hell. But hell is not a place we have to go to. We have heaven if we can trust in Christ. So God gives us motivation. What are some of the motivations God talks about in his word Moses gave to him? Look at verse 3, if you would. One of the preparations was God's promises. Verse 3, the Lord thy God, he will go over before thee. And he will destroy these nations from before thee. Thou shalt possess them. What is God saying? See, what they were going to do is go into the promised land, and God was going to give it to them. And there was a lot of good things in the promised land. But they were going to have to fight for it. And the people in the promised land, they were big boys. You ever see some guy, and it's like he's really big and, and bulk, and, and it's muscle? It's like, that's a big guy. Stay away from him. Amen? If you're in an alley, you want him on your side. Well, there was a bunch of big guys there. But God had already promised them, don't look at their stature. I am going to go in before you. I'm going to discomfort them, and you are going to win. Yep. Amen. By the way, he needed to reiterate that promise because the reason they walked around in circle for 40 years is because they didn't believe that promise in the first place. And as we look in our Bibles, we know the promise was true. When they spent the, sent the spies to the very first city and they met Rahab, Rahab's like, 40 years later, they were afraid to go in. And 40 years later, Rahab's like, we know who you are, and we're scared to death. God had already worked it out. Yeah. Aren't you thankful that God gives his promises? The Bible is a book of promises. Sometimes I've seen these little books and it's like God's book of promises and it just has all the different verses. Promises. You know what? That's God's motivation to say, listen, if you'll just do what you do, good things are out there. Yep. Promises. By the way, that's why it was called the promised land. They'll live on the promises of God. But that's not all the motivation that he gave them. He also gave them God's present. Not presence, but his present. Look at verse 5. And it's, it's kind of the same thing with the promise, but he says, And the Lord shall give them up before your face. God was going to hand them the, pe the people on a platter. God was going to give it to them. He's just going to, here's a present. The promised land, you don't have to work for it. You're going to get fields that are ready to go that you didn't plant. Houses to live in you didn't build. There it is. How did they win the battle of Jericho? Here's a brilliant battle strategy. Walk around the city once. Tomorrow, do it again. Tomorrow, do it again. Do it for six days. The last day, walk around seven days. And when you're done, that seven time, blow a trumpet, and I'll just knock the walls over for you. Yeah. I like that kind of plan. Yeah. <clears throat> Exercise and victory, not a lot of effort there. What was God saying? I'm going to show you I can do this. By the way, <clears throat> you know archaeology many years ago found uh, Jericho's and they found that the walls fell outward, like God said. You know, when you fight a city and you knock the walls down, you usually knock them inward. God just knocked them outward and said, run on in. This is all for you. But God, God gives us good things. Do you know, sometimes we're like, you know, I'm a good person, Lord. I deserve this. You may be a good person in the world's eyes, but we don't deserve anything from God. He gives it to us. We ought to be thankful for that. Before we need on, we need to understand something about the presence God gives us. You know, presents are freely given. But you know, presents aren't free. 
Someone pays for them. Presents have to be received because they're offered. And God presents so much to us. It starts with salvation, and he doesn't force it on us, and he paid for it. All we have to do is accept it, and then after us, he continually offers us something better. Amen. But not only that, in verse 6, we see another, another, uh, uh, another motivation. We see God's presence. Verse 6, he says, I'm going to just give them to you. I'm going to go in before you. And then he says, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not. Why does he tell them fear not? Here we go, brain surgery 101. Because they were fearful. You know, you see your children sometimes when you're doing something, they get, they get a little afraid. You say, don't, don't, don't be afraid. You're, what are you trying? You're trying to encourage them. And God's trying to encourage them, don't fear. Nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. I like that. God says, before you ever go in, I'm going to go in ahead of you and I'm going to mess with them and just prepare the place. He goes, and then when you go in, I'm going in with you, and I'm going to help you to get the total victory. You know, one good thing about the Bible is when we're, when, we, when we're in the Bible, it reminds us of God's presence. You see, because when we're not spending time with God, when we're not with the Lord, it's so easy to forget that he's with us. You look, God's everywhere. But we know he's with us, and we'll sense it when we see all the things that he says in the Bible, the encouragement that he gives us. And thank God that we have his presence. Now, I've heard so many silly things with people. You know, God's with me. I heard him tell me this when I was laying in bed. No, you, you, you had a dream. Not a real dream either. Well, God spoke to me. No, he didn't. Okay, God speaks how? Through his word. Well, I saw him. I went to the bathroom. I went out. Something was glowing. It may have been your neighbor's headlights. It's not, that's not how God works. We don't need to see him to know that he's with us. Right. Then lastly, the motivation, God's plan. Verse 10, and Moses commanded them saying at the end of every seven years in the solemnity of the year of release, every seven years they had a year of release, all the, all the, the slaves, and it's not slaves in the sense that we would think of slaves. It was slaves in the sense of people would be in debt in debt to somebody, so that's how they would pay it off. But God said, you go, if you, it's seven years, you're, you're free to go. Um, but he said, at the end of the seven years, in the, year, the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come, be, appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. In other words, what he says is, he goes, I want there to be written. In other, in other scriptures, there's other places where they would read the scripture publicly every year. The point is, God said, the plan is, you need to be hearing my word. Your, my word has got to be everything. That was the difference among many. That was the difference between the God, of the, 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 the God in the Bible and all the pagan religions. Their God wanted them to know, our God wants us to know what he says. And so the plan was, get in the Word. And I hope that's a daily part of your life. By the way, they didn't have a Bible in their possession. That was before the printing press and all of that. And so the law was written. They had to go to places to hear it heard, to hear the Bible read. Now, we aren't like that. We can all have a copy of the Bible ourselves, and we can carry it and be with us. You can have it on your phone, your iPad. You can have it everywhere. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, you should get one. I encourage you to have one. On your person. So that was the preparation. Now, in the few minutes I have left, I want us to see the purpose for it. God's given us the purpose for which he's given us his word. Very basic, but it's very foundational to our lives. Too often, uh, so, so we'll see number two, the purpose. Too often, most people think of the Bible as nothing more than a, than a good luck charm. Have you ever seen those huge family Bibles with some kind of off-the-wall looking mosaic picture on the front? They're like six feet tall and eight feet wide. You know what I'm talking about? And they're about, they're about that thick. Those aren't made to be read. You, you get that, right? Those are more like a good luck. You get it, and you put it on the coffee table, and you, and you dust it off every now and then. And when people, it's, it's nothing more than a decorative piece of furniture. Well, God wants us to have a Bible that's not a decorative piece of furniture. You know, by, you say, well, I don't have a family Bible like that. Well, if we go home and we put our Bible down, it's like, I'll see you next Sunday. You kind of do. Yeah. We're, we're not taking advantage of what God has given to us, and I would encourage you to do that. 
encourage you to bring one with you every Sunday. I know we could have it on our phones, and I'm, if you're using it on your phone or your iPad, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sparring with you. I personally don't li- like to. I read my, I, I don't, you know, I have a Bible. I always say this. I never read this Bible. Never. Used to. Quit a long time ago. I read the Bible on my iPad. That works for me. And it's a Bible program, and I keep notes in it and the whole nine yards. But when I come to church, uh, if it's on here, you know what happens. You know, we're doing the scripture in church, and you're looking at it, and you hear, dun 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 Cavaliers down by 20. Good. Okay. Uh, Lakers up by, oh, the Lakers are never up right now. But next year, they're going to get better. Right. But, or, you know, oh, I got a Facebook hit. So, I, but we need to have a Bible. It's important for us, I think, to have a Bible. We want to look in it. By the way, you want to know that I'm not just making stuff up up here, all right? Keep me accountable. But we need to have a Bible. What's the purpose of it? He tells us. Very basic. Look at verse 12. We gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, first step, that they may hear. First purpose is, we need to hear. We need to hear. When we think of, you say, what do you mean hear? That, when I think of hear, I mean we need to hear it, but we're not going to hear it if there's not a willingness to hear it. You know, sadly, a lot of people, even people that come to church, they really don't want to hear it. Now, we don't have it happen much, but sometimes we'll have someone come in and visit. We'll read something from the Scripture or say something, and they don't like it. It's been a while, but we've had people that get up. I remember a guy in Sunday school class one time. I just said something the Bible said, and he's like, oh. And he walked out. I'm, I wasn't trying to. And I didn't even say anything offensive. He just didn't, I don't know. Maybe he didn't like the way I look. That would be rare. Um, but I'm like, no, no, no. If the Bible, Bible, Bible says something, we don't kind of have that option. We ought to want to know what God says. And I'll just be honest with you, a lot of times it's good and it's encouraging, but sometimes it's like, ugh, that's okay. If we don't go, ugh, that means we have no room to grow. And there's always things in the Bible, but we have to have the willingness to want to hear what God is saying. Do you really want to hear from God? Not like these fake TV preachers. One guy got up, Jesse DePlantis, he wants to take an offering so he can buy a $55 million personal jet. And he already has one. God wants him to have one so he can fly around the world. Okay, whatever. It's selfish. But they they get up and like, oh, all this, and God, I, I was in bed and God spoke to me. Maybe the neighbors upstairs were having a fight. Okay. I want to hear from God. I want to hear His voice. We hear God's voice right here. That's where it is. It's in His Word. You say, no, 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 no. I want to hear God speak out loud. Then read the Bible out loud. Because God's not going to speak to you out loud. He doesn't do that anymore because the Bible is complete. And by the way, if God said something out loud, it would match up what the Bible says exactly. And so let's, let's want to hear what God says. Many people just shut their ears. You know, there's a lot of upheaval in politics today. And by the way, it's okay if we have difference of opinion. By the way, we we might want to think scripturally and not CNN or MS, LSD as I call it. You know, we might want to just find out things. But you know what's funny? I've seen these videos before where guys will go on college campuses and these people will be totally against something. And he'll say, well, give me an example of it or tell me how that's happened. And they're just like, um, um. After the presidential elections, there was this huge ladies' march or whatever. They had one in Texas. It was huge. And, you know, the president is going to hate women and do all this and his policies. And there was a guy that was there, and I saw the video, and he just asked the lady who organized it. He goes, can you give me a couple of examples of what you're afraid that he's going to do? And she's like, um. Uh, she didn't have an answer. You know, sometimes we want to just do things, but we don't want to hear what's going on on either side. Now, that's fine in some things, but when it comes to the Bible, we ought to want to hear what God says. We can't claim ignorance because God's given us what he said right here. So let's be willing to hear what God says. But it goes beyond that. Look what he says. To hear and that they may learn. 
In other words, sometimes we hear something like, yeah, I heard what you said, but we're not thinking about what it says, right? You know, tell, you tell your kids to do something. They heard it, but they don't do it. Because well, you understand I was not just saying words so that you can memorize the words. I want you to actually learn what it means. God doesn't want us just to hear things. God wants us to really understand what is God saying here? What does God really want? Learn. And by the way, it's not that hard if we would just stop and think about it a little bit. When we learn, we desire that which we've heard to really make a difference in our life. That, I hope that's why we come to church. I hope that's why we read our Bible. We want to really learn what is God saying here so we can understand it. Amen. And it leads us to a next point. And fear the Lord thy God. Now, we talked a little bit about that last week. What does it mean to fear the God? It means that we really understand who he is. You know, most people in this country, most even people that would claim to be Christians, they have no idea who God really is. You know what he is? He's a bumper sticker phrase. Jesus is my co-pilot. Well, first of all, your car's not flying. Second of all, let him drive, okay? Jesus, we try to bring a, you know, he's my buddy. You know, God is holy. God is just. He's merciful. He's gracious. But he is so far beyond who we are. And we're never going to respond to him correctly until we understand that. And we don't understand that unless we're in his word. When we're in his word, if you read the Bible, like, why did God do that? You know, the story of Ananias and Sapphira in the early days of the church. People were being persecuted, so the believers were selling things and, and giving some of what they were selling to help their fellow Christians who were losing their jobs. And Ananias and Sapphira, they liked the praise that those who were selling got, so they sold a piece of land, they lied about how much they sold it for, and they said that they gave all of it when they didn't give all of it. And by the way, God never told them to sell the land. God never told them to give everything. But God did not like the fact that they lied in front of the whole church. You say, what did he do? He struck them dead. Now, I'm glad God's not doing that today. Okay, we wouldn't have a lot of us in church probably the pulpit would be empty, right? But in that time, God was trying to show the church, this is a big deal. I'm holy. Don't be lying. Now, is that means we walk around if we, if we, God's going to, no, no, no. God's trying to put a point. Listen, he is a holy God. We need to understand who he is. And that's not a fear like, uh, that's a fear like reverence to God. We understand who he is. Now, yes, he loves us, and we can be close to him. Don't get me wrong, but we need to understand. Let's not humanize him too much. Let's understand who he is. How do we do that? We understand that when we're in the Bible. Then he says, and observe all the words of his law. So we hear God's word, we learn God's word, we learn to fear, and we learn to observe. You know what observe is? It's actually doing what it says. You see, God wanted our relationship with him to touch every area of our lives, every day of our lives. It was not like in, in, in Ephesus, they had, a, uh, uh, they had the temple of Diana, one of the seven wonders of the world. It was nothing more than a huge place of prostitution. That's how they worship Diana. They go there, they see the lady priest, immorality, and that's how they worship, and they went home. And once they went home, it made no difference in their life whatsoever. I went and I gave my Diana and there's, and there's other gods. But God says, you know what? What I want is I want you to be like I want you to be. I want you to be a representative of me on this earth. And the fact that you have a relationship with me makes a difference in every single area of your life. And it ought to. How does that happen? We learn the word of God, and we do what it says. The Bible is the book of God with the instructions he expects us to understand and obey. Look, if you, ever, if you have children and you ask them to do something, do you just tell them to do something you want them to be able to tell you exactly what you told them to do? I don't. 
I want them to do what I told them to do. Well, Dad, I, I memorized it. You said take the trash out. I can quote it backwards. Out trash the take. I can tell you what trash means in the Greek. What the means in Hebrew. I can take you outside and show you where the trash is supposed to go. I can give you the schedule of the trash truck that's coming by. Listen, I don't care. I want the trash out. Especially when you have one of your grandkids' diapers in there. Get it out now. Okay? God says, listen, I'm giving you my word. I want you because I want it to help you. Now, let's go back. You say, this all seems a little bit rigid. Go back to the promises. Go back to the presence he gives us. Go back to his presence in our life. Go back to his plan. All of that comes about as we do what the Bible tells us to do. We can't get the good stuff without knowing what God says and doing what God says. By the way, it'll make a difference. Sometimes people say, you know, I'm praying for victory over a certain habit or certain a sin in my life. Don't pray for victory over it. Pray for God to empower you as you seek to be obedient in that area to God. We want everything to be mystical. Lord, I'm a thief. Please help me to stop being a thief. Quit stealing. Say, Lord, help me to quit stealing. I'm going to seek to quit being a thief. Okay? The Bible's real clear. Here we go. It's mystical. Let him that steal, stole, steal, steal no more. That's profound. What does that mean in the Greek? It means, let him that steal, steal no more. Just do it. If God's asking you to do it, and you know he says you do it, and you seek to do it, he'll give you the power to do it. Okay, I'm losing friends. Lastly, we're done. Another thing, part of his word is to continue. Look at verse 13 and 14. Because, see, everything we do isn't just about us. It says, and that their children which have not known anything. By the way, when we say you kids don't know anything, I always joke around my kids, like, listen, they have children. It's like, look, I forgot more about child rearing than you're ever going to know. Okay, that's not true, but I'm joking. But I'm trying to, look, I've already been down that road. He says, listen, you don't know anything. May hear. And learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land, whether you go over Jordan or possess it. And I'll, I'll quote this to you, but in the next chapter, 32 and verse 46, and he said unto them, set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. One of the things God says is, if you'll do those things you're supposed to do, you can pass it down to your children so that the next generation gets it. It's not just about us. You know, the, I'll say this, I'm done here, I really am. The saddest thing about a Christian who doesn't really seek to know God's word and live it is the effect that that has on their children. You know. The things he mentioned, the first two for the children, to learn and to fear, he mentioned that to them early on. They're watching you. They don't expect you to be perfect. Praise God for that. But you know what the kids want to know? You do love God and you are trying to go the right direction and do the right thing. And they catch that. You know, you know what we want for this church? We don't just want you. We want 20 years from now, this church to be strong because all your children are in here and they're going for God because you went for God. That's passed down. And if you don't pass it down, who will? They catch our unfaithfulness. If church is just a once every now and then thing to you, you know what you're telling your children? You can sit there and say, God's important. I love God. But in their mind, they're like, in your life, it's not there. Those are just words. So we need to pass that on. Children are, are not just a blessing, although they are a blessing. Now, I've met some that they're close, okay? Uh, but they're not just a blessing. They're a responsibility. Responsibility. We want to make sure we're passing it down. Why does God speak to us? Because he wants us to hear what he's saying. He wants us to learn what he has said. He wants us to understand who he really is from his word. And he wants us to obey what he said so we can pass it down to our children. That's what he wants. All the We want the blessings, we just don't want the... It's like, you know, it's, there's no such thing as a spiritual get-rich plan. God, give me the blessings without me doing what I'm supposed to do. It doesn't work. 
But if we follow his word, we'll experience what they experienced. As you see their history, whenever the children of Israel follow God, victory and blessing was theirs. Whenever they turned away from God, what happened? They lost the blessing. They lost the battles. And so God throws it out there for us today. Let's stand this morning.